Welcome to In the Desert of Set, a pagan and occult website by G.B. Marion. I'm G.B. Marion. I write about life as a polytheist in contemporary times with random, long-winded detours into ancient history, classic horror movies, and all kinds of other fun stuff. Won't you join me for today's adventure? If you'd like to read a free electronic print copy of the following recording, please visit desertofset.com. In West Craven's A Nightmare on Elm Street from 1984, some teenagers start having nightmares in which they're menaced by this disfigured creep who has knives and fingers. Whenever this asshat kills someone in their dreams, they die in real life at the same time. One of the teenagers, Nancy Thompson, played by Heather Lingenkamp, discovers that when they were little children, their community was terrorized by a serial killer who preyed on little kids. The man was arrested and put on trial, but he got off on a technicality and was released. Then, fearing for the children's safety, the parents of the community took the law into their own hands and burned the killer alive. But this has only made things worse, for it is the killer's ghost who now haunts the kids in their dreams, seeking revenge against the parents by finishing what he started. Now it's up to Nancy to find a way of execrating this evil spirit. On the one hand, A Nightmare on Elm Street has more than its fair share of devoted fans. On the other, it receives far more derision from mainstream critics and the general public than it really deserves. I blame this on most of the sequels, which became increasingly goofy with each new installment. By the end of the 1980s, Freddy Krueger was practically a live-action cartoon character, and this is the version of him that most people remember today. Sequels like The Dream Warriors from 1987 and The Dream Child from 1988 are more like self-parodies than straight horror films. They don't even bother to take themselves that seriously. But if you watch the original Nightmare from 1984, I promise you, even if it doesn't scare you, it will make you quite uncomfortable at the very least. There is absolutely nothing funny about this film at all, and the Freddy Krueger character is really just the tip of the iceberg. When the film begins, the daylight reality in which Nancy and her friends all live seems safe enough, but as Freddy Krueger becomes more prominent in their dreams, the ugly truth about their everyday world begins to unfold. These things are never stated to the audience outright, but viewers will notice that Nancy's parents are divorced and that the proceedings of this arrangement were anything but amicable. Nancy's mother is an alcoholic and her father, the town sheriff, only shows up whenever there's a tragedy. At the same time, her friend Tina's mother also seems to be divorced and would much rather spend time with her boyfriend in Las Vegas than stay with her daughter, even when she knows the poor kid has been having terrible nightmares. Rod's parents seem to be completely absent from his life, leading him to take on a life of petty crime. And then there's Glenn, played by a baby-faced Johnny Depp, whose parents demonize Nancy for no good reason aside from the fact that two of her friends are dead. It's ironic that these parents once resorted to mob justice to protect their community, for they don't seem to care very much about their community now. None of them are involved in their children's lives anymore, and none of them seem to care that much when each other's kids die. When Tina gets butchered, Rod is immediately accused of the crime, and none of the adults ever question this. We never see Tina's mother afterwards, so we're left to wonder if she even grieves for her daughter at all. When Rod gets strangled by Freddy in his jail cell, it's clear to all the adults that it was suicide, and no one shows any kind of sympathy for him. Clearly, Tina and Rod's deaths mean nothing to Glenn's parents, who seem to think they can avoid having anything like that happen to Glenn by keeping him away from Nancy. Meanwhile, Nancy knows exactly what's happening, but no one will believe or even listen to her, even when the evidence is staring them in the face. For Duat's sake, she can't even get any help from her father, the sheriff. 
It is this complete absence of parental support that makes the film truly terrifying, in my opinion. Never mind the idea that Nancy and her friends are being targeted by a supernatural force. Freddy Krueger is simply the 1980s American version of an ancient Akkadian Alu demon, a spirit that terrifies people while they sleep. And the ancient Akkadians knew well enough how to deal with such things. If an Akkadian child reported having certain experiences while he or she was asleep, his or her parents didn't take any chances. They simply execrated the Alu with their magic, and the problem usually went away. So the idea of Freddy Krueger in and of himself is not that impressive. Entities like him are just little things in this world, and it doesn't take that much to get rid of them. It would help if the Elm Street families were willing to entertain the possibility of such events in the first place. But even more importantly, the fact that the children can neither trust nor depend on their parents is a serious problem. That is what enables demonic forces like Freddy to perpetuate themselves in the first place, and that is what disturbs me most in this film. Mind you, I'm not claiming that every childhood boogeyman is actually real. Nor do I contend that magical thinking is always the best answer to one's problems. But if I had a kid, and she told me that some freak was coming after her in her dreams, I wouldn't laugh at her or treat her like she's crazy. I'd say, well, it could be one of two things going on here, hon. It could be that there really is some freak coming after you in your dreams, or it could be that it's just a dream and nothing more. Either way, I say we whack the fucker just in case. And then I'd have her draw a picture of the creep that's scaring her, and we'd hurl all kinds of abusive language at him in Set's good name. We'd stick pins in his ass and chop him up into little pieces, and then we'd throw him in the fireplace and watch the little bastard burn. Call me superstitious if you like, but like the Akkadians, I don't believe in taking any chances with this kind of shit. No kid should ever have to face a monster alone like Nancy does in Nightmare on Elm Street. If it seems crazy that I'm talking about the things that happen in Nightmare like they're real, I'd like to point out that the film is partially inspired by true events. During the 1970s, director Wes Craven read an article in the LA Times about a group of Khmer refugees who were living in the United States and whose children were having nightmares that disturbed them so badly they refused to sleep. Some of them later died in their sleep and it was as if they had known they would die if they didn't stay awake. This story disturbed Craven to his core, and it later became his main inspiration for writing Nightmare. Craven has also said that he took inspiration for the film from certain Buddhist and Taoist ideas, and anyone who's ever listened to the man talk will know that he actually believed in some kind of spirit world. The Nancy Thompson character is easily the best thing about this film. In fact, She's the very best final girl since Laurie Strode in Halloween from 1978 and Ellen Ripley in Alien from 1979. Unlike Laurie, Nancy becomes aware of her nemesis early in the film and she actively hunts him down. And unlike Ripley, she has no weapons aside from her own determination and resourcefulness. Nancy eventually discovers that if she holds on to something in her dreams while she's waking up, she can bring it over to the real world. She decides to conduct this extremely dangerous experiment with Kruger, and when it proves successful, the tables are immediately turned. Freddy finds himself at Nancy's mercy, suffering every form of abuse the teenager can throw at him. He even becomes afraid of her at one point. And considering just how slimy a character Freddy really is, it feels really good to see him get his comeuppance this way. This humiliation of the antagonist is a recurring theme in many of Wes Craven's films, including The Last House on the Left from 1972, The Hills Have Eyes from 1977, The Serpent and the Rainbow from 1988, The People Under the Stairs from 1991, and Scream from 1996. There is almost always a transition point in these movies where the surviving victims gain some kind of advantage over the villains, and the villains become blubbering, pathetic fools. I believe Craven's intention here was to demonstrate that while evil may often seem very powerful and formidable, it only has as much power as we allow it to have. When we take that power back, 
evil is revealed for the frail and empty little thing that it really is. And in the original script for Nightmare on Elm Street, that is exactly what happens. Nancy defeats Freddy Krueger by taking back all the energy she's put into him with her fear, and his spirit is dissolved back into the void forever. My only criticism of A Nightmare on Elm Street is the fact that its ending was sloppily changed at the last minute and for purely commercial reasons. Nancy defeats Kruger, and all seems well, but then she realizes she's actually having another nightmare, and the rotten bastard gets her after all. This ending always leaves a very bad taste in my mouth. They go through the entire movie, developing this really likable character who's noble and strong, and who succeeds in defeating and even humiliating the villain. Then they pull the rug out from under her at the last minute just to give the audience one last jump scare. Grant it. It scared the hell out of me when I first saw this film as a kid, but as an adult who's digested the rest of Wes Craven's work, I can see just how uncravenian it really is. As it turns out, Craven had a major dispute with Nightmare's producer, Robert Shea, who wanted a scary ending to set the stage for a sequel. Craven eventually gave in to Shea's demands just so they could finish making the damn film. I think this was an unfortunate choice on Craven's part, as it prevents Nightmare from being a truly perfect film, but the rest of the film holds up remarkably well, even after 30 years, so at least there's that. When you stop to think about it, sleep really is kind of a scary thing. If we hold to the Cartesian definition of existence, I think, therefore I am, well, we technically cease to exist for a while when we aren't awake. Sure, our bodies are still there and our brains continue to function, but we don't really think in the normal sense of the term since we aren't conscious. In a way, we all become like Schrodinger's cat when we're asleep. We're neither alive nor dead, and we only collapse back into a solid state of reality when we regain our capacity for conscious self-reflection. We're extremely vulnerable while we're in this state, both physically and otherwise. And this is partly what the Egyptians were getting at with their tales about Ra being menaced by Apep in the underworld each night. By attacking Ra, Apep isn't just posing a cosmic threat against the creator. It's also posing a personal threat against all creatures that sleep and dream. Nancy Thompson's struggle with Freddy Krueger is a perfect representation of this principle, especially since it's built upon fears that many cultures traditionally associate with sleep. Apep and Krueger are both astral monsters that try to kill living things while they regenerate, whether this means a sleeping creator or a sleeping human. Both attempt to kill the future, whether by preventing the dawn or by murdering children. Both thrive when the good do nothing, whether this is due to a paralyzing gaze or a conspiracy of silence. And both are easily overpowered once you learn how to see through their tricks, whether this is achieved by a badass thunder god or a plucky suburban teenager. In this way, I consider the character of Nancy Thompson to be a true daughter and warrior of set. Incidentally, here is a procedure you can use to help you feel a little bit more like Nancy Thompson whenever you might need it most. If you ever get scared when you're in bed at night, give this procedure a shot. No Freddy Kruegers can hold a candle to the awesome power of he before whom the sky shakes. Get you a blank piece of paper and some red paint. If you don't have any red paint, that's okay, no problem. Just use a red pen. Draw a donkey that's facing left and write the word... A-I-I, in the shape of a triangle on its neck. Then write Lerthemino on its back, and write Sabayoth on its breast. Finally, write the name Abrasax directly beneath the donkey's hooves, so it looks like the donkey is walking on the word. You don't have to be a great artist, even the simplest and most childlike scribblings will do. Just make absolutely sure that you draw the donkey face into the left and that you write the words of power exactly as I've said. And when you're finished, your painting or drawing 
should look something like what you can see at the link that is provided along with this podcast. Next, place this painting or drawing in a folder or something else in which it can stay unfolded and flat. Under no circumstances should you fold or crumple it. You must never let sunlight touch this image you've created. It must always be kept in darkness. Once you've placed it inside a folder, place it under the mattress of your bed. Preferably, it should be sandwiched between your mattress and your springboard. If the negative energy in your home seems to be centered on someone in the house, such as a child, place the folder under his or her mattress instead. You can make one of these donkey images for each person who lives and sleeps in your home if you like. Just follow the exact same procedure for each one. Make sure you place the images in areas where they can't be seen, where no sunlight can touch them, and where they're close to you and your loved ones while you sleep. Keep them there for at least seven days and seven nights. You can then feel free to remove them after that amount of time has passed. I like to hold on to the images I create for this spell. It doesn't really matter if sunlight touches the images after the seven days. But if you'd like to dispose of the images after you've completed using them, I would burn them in a votive fire and make a point of thanking Set for his help. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this sermon and you'd like to read some more, please check out desertofset.com. I hope you have a wonderful day. Set bless.